What's up, freshman? Mr. Brickwood's back. Uh, this will be just a one-part imperialism lecture. Uh, these are the these are the terms I would make sure that we kind of have a understanding of before you get into, you know, whether it's imperialism or colonization. You're really talking about the same thing. You're talking about building an empire. You're talking about expansion. You're talking about controlling an area. And, you know, we understand that the Industrial Revolution is going to separate the haves from the have-nots. And you're going to see these industrialized nations able to mass produce weapons and, you know, using steel like human beings have never known. And these indigenous people, these natives, these, um, na whether it's Native Americans or it's the indigenous Australians, people who naturally habitat that for centuries, for millennial, they are going to be overwhelmed by these new technologies and the use of these weapons by these industrialized powers. And um, what justifies them to do so, quote unquote, will be the idea again of social Darwinism, that the reason they do get imperialized and the reason why these European countries, Western European mainly, and Russia as well, will look to expand and do this is because they can. And it's survival of the fittest again. Why does the strong pick on the weak? Because they're stronger. And the weak either need to, to die or they need to get um, imperialized. And that's kind of the concept. It's very cold. It's very, uh, you know, from our modern standards, we, it's tough to absorb. Um, but another reason they believed it, and we'll get back to Kipling on this, was the whole idea around the white man's burden. And uh, the belief that it's the white man's burden. I have it in quotations because it's these Western Europeans' job and America's job to lift up these indigenous people, um, you know, and bring them civilization, quote unquote, bring them Christianity, quote unquote. Um, when you read into some of these things that happen on, on that behalf, it is dark. It's very dark. Imperialism is frowned upon today. You look at it in hindsight, you're like, wow, that's horrible. Um, at the time, these people were swept up in expansion an empire building, that nationalism, this intense pride in your nation, and let's have the biggest empire. And this is going to lead to this this exploitation of um, these these people in that outer zone. Going back to that three zones from Industrial Revolution, the, the inner core, the outer core, and then the outside. These people are going to be exploited. Their resources are going to be exploited. And also, these countries that are making all this industry, all these materials, these finished products, they want to market to sell them in. They want to uh, make money off these things. So they want to expand that market. And this is imperialism in a nutshell. Now, looking at empire building, you know, it's been around since I mean, arguably the beginning of, of civilization. And, you know, whether you date back to the Persian Empire, you go to the Macedonian Empire, whether you go to Greek, Greek Empire, whether you go to uh, especially the Roman Empire, you're looking at a picture of the Roman Empire here. Now, as time goes on, it becomes a little easier to travel, so you can you can expand and conquer further distances, um, but it's limited in scope. Especially the Greeks, more of a city-state power, not it's more of a kind of a local power, regional power, um, where you can see Roman Empire expands a little bit further. And these maps are deceiving; they don't have all that power in all these places, but they can, in time, send troops to these places. Um, so this is looking at empire building. And we understand that Great Britain, when they're studying, they're going to be the greatest imperializers. They're going to conquer lands a third of the uh, world. We look at them. They model themselves after Rome. They they read up on the Roman Empire and this building this this um, you know this this empire up and conquering these lands. Now what's going to be different by the time Great Britain takes control? You know around the 1700s, 1800s into the 1900s is the fact that technology has advanced to the point where they can travel greater distances. Uh, the Suez Canal will be built through here, 10 year project. It's going to eliminate them having to travel 4,000 miles around Africa's tip. It'll cut off 4,000 miles for them to get to their empires in Asia over here. So we look at this technology and they're going to conquer some geography to allow them to to broaden their scope and their range. And, you know, we see a lot of countries building up their navies at this time to have a powerful navy. Nobody was more powerful than Britain at its at its height. So we look at this, this empire building, and uh, we see this 
with imperialism. Now, again, as I mentioned, you have the haves versus the have-nots. These countries who are industrialized, the Great Britons, the Germanys, the French, you know, and America eventually, they're going to be able to oppress, exploit, uh, use these manufacturing of railroads and machine guns and guns and bullets and artillery and these these artillery guns. Um, we'll get into those in World War One, but they're building and mass producing this stuff. These indigenous people cannot compete with with this kind of scale of economics and this mass production and the brutality these people are bringing with them as well. So. Do you understand imperialism is going to be a dark chapter? Um, as I mentioned, those who industrialize are going to be superpowers. Um, they're going to be able to dictate world events at the time. And, you know, because of that. Now, we see England over here. And, you know, hopefully you're looking at this. And you're, you're looking at how, you know, the top hat, the industry, that's what that's representing, is, is a sea monster, essentially. It's conquering all of these different lands throughout the world. And this is looking at um, England. They will be the best at it. Um, and they want reasons why. They want raw materials. They want markets for goods. They want to set up military bases to protect those markets and those investments. They want to spread Christianity. Missionaries will be spreading crap traveling across the world. So you see all these different reasons for why people are imperializing and they're trying to get wealthy and they're going to get really wealthy off the backs of others it's a, again it's a dark chapter if you look into it it'll be darker than i even talk about um you know we have belgium they'll be going into the the heart of africa the congo and they're going to kill 10 million africans um so we look at this stuff it's just it's just it's, it's horrible again based off modern standards now Again, going back to the thesis, the argument, we can make the argument that, and this goes back to Tom Standage, the book, you guys saw how coffee led to revolution. Another drink, a beverage that changed the course of history was actually tea. And we see how it changed the course of history. Um, tea and imperialism go hand in hand because workers in the 18th century, 1700s, they will start to consume tea. And, you know, it sharpens your mind. It kept workers alert on, you know, long and tedious shifts. And it built up natural antibacterial properties also in, in tea, which will reduce the prevalence of waterborne diseases. So infant mortality declines, life expectancy goes up. And, you know, people are drinking this stuff. They're consuming it like they're consuming coffee. And they want more of it. Now, the problem is, is it's coming out of China. Now, as I mentioned before, China was more advanced than Western Europe for for centuries and um, a lot of our modern you know technology we use actually came out of China but we see that what the problem is is China's so advanced all the industry that England's making all these goods in their factories China doesn't want them they don't want these they, they, they look at them as an inferior product um, you know it's, it's just a it's almost a knockoff brand of coach or whatever it may be they just do not think it's quality products they don't want that stuff they don't want the stuff coming out of these factories so instead all they want from England is silver so what happens is England the Englishmen they start to buy tea um, and they start to fork over you know millions billions of dollars in today's money of money to get tea so they're forking over silver for tea and we see here is we, we have a trade deficit in England. England realizes they're going to be out of silver if they keep purchasing tea. So they have to find a way to get this money back into England. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to take over a country um, back in the 1763 after the Seven Years' War. They're going to take over an area known as India today. And they're going to conquer this region. And they're going to do it very brutally. And why are they in India? They're going to um, eventually, in, in by the mid-1800s, early 1800s, they're going to start growing a crop in India, in Bango, India, India, called opium. And they're going to grow that crop, and then they're going to smuggle it into China. And um, they're going to start to sell this, this opium for silver from the Chinese, who are going to get very addicted to this stuff. It's Like I said, it's the natural uh, or the main ingredient of heroin, so we know it's highly addictive. And you're going to see many Chinese uh, people start to get ad addicted. Um, it gets real bad. They have opium dens where they're just sitting and smoking and getting high all day. And 
the Chinese asked the English to please stop sending this opium over. And the English are going to continue to do so. Um, we actually had like a president, former president, his grandfather, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He actually was a drug dealer. He actually would um, go into a port over there called Canton, spelled the exact same way as Canton. And he would he would drop off this opium in the cover of darkness, and he would you know make money and get out. That's how a lot of that's how the Roosevelts made a shilling um, off this opium trade. And we see other Europeans and Americans doing this, selling this stuff over there. And the Chinese actually get so fed up with it um, because they see it's destroying their country. They actually go to war. Uh, they declare war on the British in 1839. And it's known as the first of a few opium wars. And what you'll see happen is, is the English are going to destroy um, the Chinese militarily. You know, the Chinese have fallen behind militarily. They don't have the industrialization. They haven't gone through the Industrial Revolution, where these Europeans have. And what happens is, is they get defeated easily. And there's, there's a famous story where 29 Chinese ships, warships, show up to go fight the British. The British just have two ships, and they get crushed, the Chinese, um, because the ships are just more advanced from the British Army. And they're using, you know, guns that are, can outrange, outgun, um, outmaneuver, and they have, obviously, they're made with thicker um, iron and steel. So we see this, and this is um, this is going to lead to the Opium Wars, and we'll see the Chinese are defeated, which and then England will get more um, strict and get more stuff out of China, and um, it'll lead to other European countries demanding a piece of China as well. And we can see, um, you know, the Queen of England actually, and we got Germany. And we have Russia, we have Japan, and we have um, England looking, I'm sorry, France looking on. So we see this is looking at the spheres of influence you didn't know as. And this is where other countries, they want to market in China as well. They want to sell their goods. They want resources from these areas. And you can see Britain gets the large portion. Uh, you can see Germany is going to be later to the table. And you can see that if you're looking at this, the Chinese are begging them. And we have a caricature of here. We have the Chinese begging, please stop as they're carving up the the pie, the pizza um, of China. And we have some aggression going on here as well. Knives are drawn um, and people are studying what part they get of China and China doesn't really have a say. And it's really capturing that series of influence. This obviously is 1910, um, but this is going on in the late 1800s um, when other countries want a part of this as well. And you're going to see America get involved as well. And what happens? Well, the Chinese are going to get fed up with all these foreign influences. So they're going to have something known as the Boxer Rebellion, where they're going to attempt to push out foreign devils, they call them, these, these Christian missionaries, these Catholics and uh, Protestants trying to bring their religion within China, changing their culture. So you're going to see these boxers. They call themselves, by the Western, they're called the, uh, the boxers. They're actually called like the Harmonious Fists. Um, they were called boxers by the Western press because they, they would, you know, practice martial arts and, um, you know, uh, kind of um, somewhat, I don't want to say train like a boxer, but they kind of had that kind of physique. And they're going to start to spring up and they're going to start to slaughter a lot of these Western missionaries, these Christians who are trying to spread the Christian faith, these Europeans. And they're going to actually siege a city. And you're going to see these these outside countries, um, I'm sorry, these outside countries actually bring in combined armies and they're going to crush the boxers. The one thing about the boxers, they thought they were um, impervious or invincible to bullets and they are going to obviously not be. Um, it'll be put down and it'll lead to even more oppression towards the Chinese. So um, this is the China and this is you know, the great Asian power falling to these European hordes, um, uh, barbarians, quote unquote, coming in and taking um, advantage of their weak state militarily. One other country is going to be late to the scene, but they want to have a market in China as well. You don't see them here on this map, will be um, the United States. These two political cartoons kind of capture that. You got the United States. They want to open the door, and it's going to be known as the open door policy. They want to open their door into China as well, um, trying to get access to the trade markets. We will see them get open that door when they go to the uh, in the Spanish American War. You'll say that more. You'll say that next year. 
Uh, America goes to war with Spain, and as a result, they get their Spanish uh, empire. They get, they're going to take the Philippines from them, which is just south of China. And the reason why the United States wanted that is because they have a um, springboard into Asia. So we see um, this is looking at the open door policy it's known as. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have you know, Great Britain that the sun never sets on the British Empire. The blood never dries. It was a kind of quote back then. You can see how much influence they had throughout the world. Now, again, we look at these maps. They're deceiving. They don't have as much power as maybe you see here, but they do have a lot of influence in these regions. And again, they're looking to set up markets. They're looking to set up, um, make profit off these places. And as I mentioned, in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris, after defeating the French in the French and Indian War, they're going to get access to the... Um, southern part of Asia, looking at India. So we can see, and this is going to be the crown jewel, they call it, of the British Empire. They make a lot of money off of it. And then we also have the Suez Canal, which was um, finished in 1869, I believe. Yeah, um, it was a 10-year project. And again, it's going to cut off 4,000 miles of travel for the British to get to India. So it's a big, um, big investment. It's a big money maker. And again, allows them to quickly bring their navy into any kind of fray or, you know, their merchants to travel to and from. So this is looking at the global empire. This is what the Industrial Revolution allows them to do. They're going to exploit and take these areas um, and, you know, bring these resources back to England, make goods, and then sell them back to these these parts of the world. And again, this is just kind of reinforcing the Suez Canal. Um as you guys can see here, and again, cutting off and giving access. Now, this guy here, you may recognize him. He is um, somebody who actually mastered the English language. You know, he took he took lessons in Western style dance. You know, he's he's an Indian who who practiced the customs of the Westerners. He actually went to um, and studied at the university and uh, college in London, and he wanted to be involved in law. And he's going to be, um, you know, dressed like a Westerner. What he finds out when he's in South Africa, and we'll we'll get into that after World War One, uh, kind of close it down this year. But they practice something known as apartheid, which was segregation in, in in Africa, South Africa, which again, if you go back to this map, is part of the British Empire. And he's dressed like a Westerner, and he goes on a train. He wants to ride first class, and instead he's going to be thrown in first class because of his skin color. And this is what apartheid was, is segregation, separation based off of the color of one's skin. And this guy's name, he realizes, and what he realizes is, is no matter how much he tries to be a Westerner, he will never actually be accepted by these, these Western Europeans. And he's going to do all he can to get the British out of his, his native country, India. And his name is Gandhi, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Now, there's three quotes by him that I thought were pretty cool. Did a good job um, kind of moving. In a gentle way, you can shake the world. An eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. And as live as if you were to die tomorrow, learn as if you will live to live to forever. Um, now, another place that gets kind of conquered and oppressed by these Western European um, vultures will be Africa. And you will see these Western European nations show up to Africa and they're going to be, it's known as a scramble for Africa because you have European countries scrambling to get parts of the African pie, as you guys see over here. And we see them trying to get different regions. You know, as I mentioned, Great Britain settles in the south. You see France up north. Um, the the uh, Belgians are going to settle in the, the Congo, the center of it. And there's a book by... Um, Conrad, Joseph Conrad, it's called The Heart of Darkness, kind of captures the brutality of this. And, you know, the King Leopold is going to make millions off of this, but it's going to lead to 10 million African deaths um, in trying to extract rubber out of this region. So we see that um, these Europeans are going to be going down there. And again, they are wanting resources for their industrialization. They also want to promote their nationalism. They want to have a bigger empire. So these, these people are going to be exploited as a result. Now, we see a new nation come up on the scene um, that wants a piece of this, but you can see they're competing over this. It's going to, this is what this map kind of shows us what's going to lead to World War I eventually. But we see that this there's going to be a conference, um, and it's going to be known as the Berlin Conference, and it takes place in 1870, I believe. Um, 
don't quote me, maybe 1880. But what we have here is Berlin, Germany wants to host this, and they want to bring all these leaders in because um, they want to be at the center of this meeting. And what it is is they want to bring in pe these other European countries and try to divide up Africa and to avoid war. And so they're not fighting each other over these places. So, um, you know, the Berlin Conference is a 16-foot high map of Africa, and these 14 powers meet there. And Otto Bismarck, he's a leader of Germany at the time, he wanted, uh, again, to, to be at the center of this, his country at the center of this. And its goal was is to prevent war with each other so they can cut up Africa um, kind of, again, without any kind of war breaking out in Europe. And um, it will, again, divide up, sadly, Africa. Here's 1880. Um, so this is when the Berlin Conference goes down. And we can see by 1913, we can see how these European countries, look at the key over here, you can see different European countries influencing these regions. Um, this will end following World War II, so looking around 1945, but you can see this is the exploitation. Um, and, you know, again, we, we can focus on a negative, which I've kind of brought, highlighted, but there's also going to bring some modernization, gonna bring medicine here. They're going to bring technologies. Um, they're going to bring Im improvements in transportation and communication in these regions. So there'll be some highlights. There's just a lot of darkness in, in within it as well. Um, and, you know, there'll be hunger and poverty and famine, you know, and today we have, you know, different, different places, not all of them, but some of these places, countries there have warlords fighting over power and filling this power vacuum that's going to be left behind following these, these European countries leaving. So, um, and I saw, I just saw this map the other day. I thought this was pretty cool. Just talking about how big Africa is and we can see the United States, China, India, and Eastern Europe, uh, these parts of it would fit within Africa. Um, and Western Europe, you can see over here as well. So this just shows us the size of this continent. I just think it's impressive to kind of remind ourselves of that. Now, <clears throat> you guys looked at the poem, kind of Know Thyself. We're looking at Kipling and um, with his poem called If. He's also going to write about something known as, you guys saw this in your terminology, the white man's burden. And um, Kipling's going to have a more positive viewpoint on imperialism. And for this week, I, I, I'm going to sign you guys, you guys will see it, um, to look into this poem, The White Man's Burden, to read up on it. And then you're also, I'm going to ask you to get to know Kipling a little bit, um, look at his biography, so you're able to see the context of why maybe he thought the way he did. But if you guys look at this political cartoon, I want you folks to dissect it. What do you think is going on here? What do you see? Um, and again, I want you to come up with that on your own. And then we have another picture, again, capturing that white man's burden as it was known. And again, I'm going to ask you guys to tackle this. And then we have the other side, the flip side. This is Joseph Conrad. I've had uh, students read his book, Heart of Darkness, in the past. I'm going to have you folks read up on him a little bit, his biography, and see his viewpoints. He has a more negative perspective on imperialism. And I want you to look at his biography and figure out why do you think that would be, maybe. Um, and I'm going to ask you guys to do a little independent research and see if you can find any reason to why he would have a negative, um, kind of assign a negative connotation to the, the imperialism. Now, looking at this, um, we have China imperialized and have the spheres of influence. We have the scramble for Africa and some other, some other places are going to be put on notice. And one of those places was very isolated, very isolated to the extreme. Um, where they had a fuel system and their, their merchant class was, was at the very bottom rung of society. They didn't do very highly of them. They were not allowed to um, do a lot of trade outside of Japan, these merchants. And they really kind of, um, they really isolated themselves from the outside world. And they, they followed this samurai class. They were not unified at all. And they would only open trade with one European country, the Dutch, also known as the Netherlands, um, twice a year, and they would come into a port city um, in Japan. They would bring these goods, and he'd, the Japanese liked these goods, but they'd bring them in this this one city, uh, this port city known as Nagasaki, um, twice a year. You may have heard of it. It's also the city that gets the second atomic bomb drops on in World War II down the road. But they'd bring these Dutch in, and they they would reinforce them. They did not want them bringing their religion in, Christianity. So what they would force them to do is they would force them to um, walk on a cross as they get off their ship 
into um, Japan. Now, Japan was a unified country, had a lot of different warlords, had a lot of different um, shoguns who have the um, samurai protecting. It's very divided and, you know, there's not one ruling power at the time. And these Dutch would come in and they would trade goods and they would leave and they were not allowed to spread to Christianity. There was a story of some Japanese convert converts to Christianity that were actually crucified um, by the Japanese. And there was another guy, a Spanish um, sailor, who actually insulted a shogun or may have been the emperor at the time of Japan. And again, he wasn't a very unifying source, but they will actually crucify him as well, um, that Spanish guy. So we see it, again, that they'll be very strict with their uh, discipline and trying to keep themselves shut off. But we have this kind of cause, this sound of thunder moment, this causation, this, um, this domino effect. If we're going back to the sound of thunder, poem beginning of the year, and we'll see that um, come 1850, something something crazy happens. Um, it was actually 1853. Commodore Matthew Perry is going to show up. Japan would have remained isolated um, had Commodore Perry not shown up. And I, I can't remember how many U.S. ships show up with him, four to six, and they show up. And um, when they show up at the at the uh, Edo, which will become Tokyo, the Japanese realize something right away that they have fallen behind. And Commodore Matthew Perry comes there and he states that he'll be returning uh, within the next two years and um, two or three years. And he expects them to open their doors to the Western European powers. It didn't take much for Japan to realize also what had happened to China. So as a result, Japan realizes um, that their samurai, these, these samurai soldiers with the sword and bows, could no longer compete with these foreigners. And they also realized that these foreigners were not going to give them a choice, whether they wanted to remain isolated or open their doors, that they were either going to find a way to get stronger, to compete with these European powers, or they're going to be colonized or imperialized by these European powers. So as a result, Japan is going to go through a nationalization. They're going to unify under one emperor, um, and they're also going to have to get rid of their samurai class. And they're going to essentially go through this Meiji restoration, you can see it's spelled here, and they're going to have their emperor, named after their emperor Meiji, and you're going to see that the emperor Meiji will be the unifying force, the, the figurehead that they kind of rally around and um, modernize. So this Meiji restoration is where Japan is going to westernize, which means they're going to become more like the West. They're going to modernize, as you see the picture here, illustrate, and they're going to militarize. They're going to start building up their military. Uh, but first they have to model their mil military after the Westerners and, you know, get access to the same guns, to get access to the same um, ships, and to get access to the same tactics that these places use. So this is the Meiji Restoration where Japan is going to attempt to break out of this, um, you know, divided country, unify under one um, flag, and you will see them have to get rid of their samurai. And you can see they give up the sword and the robes to be more like the West. Uh, long hair will be cut. They will look like Westerners in many ways. And this is the Meiji Restoration, which takes place starting around 1860. And you'll see it um, lead to them becoming one of the one of their power, most powerful nations in the world. Now we look at this. Um, we look at this transformation. Many Japanese will not be willing to give up their traditions. There'll be rebellions, and these rebellions will be crushed by this new westernized army. And, you know, we kind of see the samurai become uncool overnight. You know, they were the considered the most powerful, the, the ones who protected Japanese. Now they realized um, the sword cannot compete with the gun. And we'll see Japan go through this Meiji Restoration, and then by the end of the 19th century, they're going to go to a war with China, in something known as the Sino-Japanese War, and to the world's surprise, Japan's going to defeat China, who was always viewed as big brother. And we'll see them do the things they do by 1937 uh, with the rape of Nanking and the other things leading to World War II. But they're also going to, and this really puts them on the map, um, they're going to go to war with Russia in 1905, known as the Russo-Japanese War. And 
to the world's really shock and surprise, especially Russia's, um, who didn't believe they had to listen to the Japanese at all when Japan's saying, hey, listen, we cannot have you um, in Korea. Um, you know, Russia's going to look at them and basically just laugh and say, dude, you're, you're Japan. We'll do what we want. And then Japan's going to do a sneak attack at Port Arthur, which I read to you guys, um, which preceded Pearl Harbor by 30 years. And we see that uh, the Japanese is going to not defeat Russia, but they will they will win the war. Um, when I say don't defeat Russia, they don't conquer Russia, but they get the respect that they want and they, they deserve. Um, and they're going to get their access to Korea as a result. And this is the Russo-Japanese War. So we see the Meiji Restoration take effect, um, which will eventually lead to them, again, expanding their, their imperialism. They get kind of... Uh, they get addicted to expanding and building this empire that's known as imperialism. They'll eventually try to knock America out of the Pacific with the attack at Pearl Harbor. Um, but we'll see eventually that leads to um, the defeat of Japan with the dropping of the atomic bombs. So that is looking at Japan, really quick sports center version. Um, we also have going on, it kind of gives a precursor to the, the worst war in human history up to the point. We also have 1870. Um, that's not the worst word, but we have in 1870, we have the Franco-Prussian War, and Prussia is German, um, and we're going to see the French and the Germans are going to go to war, and what happens is you will see the French still using outdated cavalry charges, um, and Germany using more advanced railroads and more advanced cannons. They're going to overwhelm the French, they'll embarrass the French, and they will march through Paris. Um, the leader of the French at the time of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 is going to be a guy by the name of Napoleon III, um, be the grandson of Napoleon I. He's going to attempt to restore France. He wants glory, um, but he's going to find out that the Germans, the Prussians, are no, they're no match for the Prussians or the Germans. Um, and you're going to see, you know, he realized during the last battle, he has a kidney stone large as a pigeon's egg. And he mounts a horse and charges through shell fire, hoping to die, but instead he gets captured. And um, Napoleon III, just remember that, because when we get to World War I, when they surrender, if you guys remember, the French are going to have them get a train car. Um, the Germans get a train car at the end of World War I when Germany loses, and that train car belonged to Napoleon III. And it's kind of just to embarrass the Germans um, for you know, to kind of wash away the defeat of the Franco-Prussian War. So... This is looking at um, what's going on. So we start seeing these countries start to compete with one another. They go to war with one another. So just planting the seeds of mistrust between them. Um, and that's going to get us into, again, so we have this Industrial Revolution, which will really ramp up and allow countries to become very powerful and take advantage of other countries, which will lead to imperialism. Um, and then this imperialism will lead to this, this squabbling and this uh, bickering over certain areas. And this mistrust will intensify and countries are going to build up their armies and mass produce these weapons and their ships and their guns. Um, and they're going to mass produce these, which will lead to eventually countries going on the edge of war. And when it gets pushed over, we're going to have that domino effect. So this is looking at imperialism. We got through it pretty quick. Um, so hope you uh, learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Till next time.